Good morning and welcome to another edition of Love and Daily, brought to you by Browns and you. Hi, Tim. How's it going? Have a good weekend? Hi, yes, very good weekend. How about you? Good, good. Not bad. Uh, the weather was a little bit uh, crappy over the past couple of days. But let's start with um, the headlines. So we'll start with the COVID update yesterday. We heard about six new cases and the R factor going above one. We'll explain a bit what that means. Uh, we also had a bit of a strange story that went internationally viral, viral yesterday. A uh, Maltese diplomat uh, who was forced to resign after comparing Angela Merkel to Hitler. Um, we have a follow-up about uh, the, the big story about Facebook about ministers and their Facebook pages. Uh, Republica, the NGO, has called for the Auditor General to investigate uh, this, this uh, issue. Um, we also had a, a sweet video over the weekend about a hairdresser who was revealing what haircuts could soon look like. God knows I need a haircut and we're all dying for uh, for the hairdressers to, to return. Um, and a tragic story about a man uh, that this was on Friday night was worth talking about, a man from Zabbar who died after being uh, hit by a stun gun and an injection uh, when the, the police and the healthcare worker were at his house uh, after a bit of a, uh, an incident. We'll talk about, about that too. But let's start with the COVID update. Six new cases yesterday, right, Tim? Yes, six new cases, um, which was a higher number of new cases than Malta has recorded in recent days. Um, but this was also offset by um, six new recoveries. So the number of active cases has remained stable at 58. Um, the rate of, of reproduction, the famous R factor, has increased to above one. But this is a little bit important because um, this because health authorities have said that worldwide that measures restrictive measures should be eased when this factor is below below one, and it had been below one in Malta for for quite a few days. Um, However, it's it, it's a figure that is constantly fluctuating as well. So we need to, we, you know, with one day it will be one, the next will be 0 0.9, depending on how many new cases are found. Um, so we'll have to wait and see in the coming days to get a more uh, complete picture of the situation. However, um, one very critical indicator on how well the country is managing um, the situation is the number of hospitalizations. and. Thankfully, in Malta's case, it remains extremely low. There's only a handful of people who are actually being treated in hospital and no one is being treated in intensive care. So when you look at the situation that other countries have faced, um, that, is quite, that is quite remarkable for, for Malta. In fact, Malta was also rated uh, the, the healthcare system the most trusted healthcare system, right? In, in Europe, I believe. Uh, there was a, a story over the weekend as well uh, with Chris Ferns to celebrating that, that achievement. Yes, I mean, it, to be fair, you know, Malta, Maltese people have had, have historically had a high level of trust in our healthcare system from before the COVID pandemic. But now, you know, it's kind of, it seems that it's bearing fruit because, you know, at a time when we need them more than ever. Mm -hmm. And we also had another story about a 65 year old who's feeling like a, um, a second class citizen in Malta because there are shops that have reopened and are, and are basically saying no, no 65 year old yeah. pluses. Um, yeah. which, which makes them feel they, they compared it to sort of racism or, or uh, you know, that, that kind of approach. Uh -huh. to... Obviously, um, I mean, there, there was a similar incident recently with regards to a pregnant woman who, was the, who tried to go to a, inside a clothes shop and was refused entry because she's pregnant and therefore she's more vulnerable. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. So first of all, um, yeah, the old, I mean, elderly people are more vulnerable to it. So technically, by allowing parents by denying her entry, you could say it's for her own good, so that there is, you know, so that she doesn't get sick. But then at the end of the day, and um, this also shows how um, unsustainable um, restrictions are in the long term as well, because you can't just keep people, um, like no matter how old they are in the house for an indefinite period of time and expect them to be completely fine with like there is also a very real need for people to to leave the house sometimes and we can't ignore this 
Yeah. So uh, we move on to the second story, and another embarrassing one for for Malta. Uh, sometimes these these things uh, make the international headlines, and, and in fact, this one did. They were on the BBC and a number of other international sites. After Michael Zamita Bona, our ambassador to Finland, uh, put up a Facebook post, a quite an outrageous Facebook post, where he's uh, basically comparing Angela Merkel, German Chancellor, to Hitler. Um, his his statement read: "75 years ago, we stopped Hitler. Who will stop Angela Merkel? She has fulfilled Hitler's dream to control Europe." Um, yeah. Now, uh, the the this this led to the Foreign Affairs Minister Evers Bartolo saying that he's going to have to issue a, an apology to the German state. Um, this is also, I guess, I, I guess. Mitabona, from a reading of his previous uh, comments on Facebook, I guess he was talking about immigration. Uh, it wasn't very clear. Having said that, he's uh, one of the companies, he's linked to the company that's hosting uh, the, the migrants at sea, the Captain Morgan uh, cruise ships at sea as well. So uh, it's not quite sure, clear what, he, what point he was making. But uh, what is sure is that this was an embarrassment to Malta. And in fact, he has had to step down from his role. Uh, must be said that. Uh, Zamita Bona is not exactly a, a diplomat by profession, uh, and, and clearly not a not a diplomat in terms of the, the way he wrote yesterday. Um, but he's actually a businessman, and and he was appointed in 2014, very close to the the Labour administration, uh, and and in fact has uh, you know benefited from a number of, of contracts uh, throughout throughout the years. Uh, what do you make of this, Tim? Is this a freedom of expression uh, issue or or uh, just an embarrassing diplomat? No, absolutely not. I mean, there were some people who were commenting and saying that oh, this guy is a right to his opinion and the state shouldn't force him to step down. But at the end of the day, um, when you're a diplomat, you're constantly representing your state. So you are not allowed to express your personal political opinion without, you know, getting without having the approval of, of, of the government you're representing in this case, Malta. And in this case, he clearly didn't. Um, it, it wasn't. It's not Malta's opinion that Merkel and Hitler are similar, which is why they have to actually issue an apology to the German state. Uh, and now, it's also potentially serious from a diplomatic point of view because, and if this had got out of hand in Germany, there could have been diplomatic repercussions between the two countries at the time when um, you know Malta's trying to position itself as 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 someone you know who's ready to help and 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 is friendly. And so it, you know, I don't think they, the government wants to make enemies on the international stage at the moment. Now, this is very basic diplomacy, though, this fact that you can't just express um, a, a political opinion like that, let alone something so so egregious as, as, as comparing someone, anyone, to Hitler. And I, I just, just also begs the question as to how he was chosen in the first place if he, just, if he made such a ba very basic error. Yeah, and why? Um, Republica uh, issued a, a statement yesterday uh, about the, the whole Facebook minister's misuse um, of taxpayer mm -hmm. money, right? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, after, after the Standards Commission had published a report into, into the misuse of public funds and resources by ministers and parliamentary secretaries on their personal Facebook pages, um, the NGO Republica has asked the Prime Minister to, to kickstart uh, an investigation by the National Audit Office to find out exactly how much money has been misused and after that has been established for that money to be returned to the state. Now, again, this, this shows um, potentially just how deep this goes. So this has been a widespread practice uh, in, in recent years, not in recent and, and basically up until Facebook, ever since Facebook was has become very popular, um, and there is a reason for this. And this is, and George Hitler had had uh, mentioned it, which is that you know ministers would rather speak to the public, as though you know even through social media, or from their own pages, rather than from the you know from the pages of an official body like a ministry. And the reason being is that there's an element of closeness to the voter, to your constituent. If you're speaking as a minister. Even if you have an assistant speaking for you, but it's as though you're speaking yourself, there is that element of closeness to to the voter when doing so, rather than having your official ministry doing that. But 
what that does is that the problem is that you're not only a minister, but you're also a politician. So the you and public funds are being used, which which are um, including by people who disagree with you politically. And it's not fair that um, public funds do get used to boost your personal profile, um, even if if they completely disagree with you politically. So this is this is a new debate in the. Um, in a world that's become dominated by social media, and um, there are there are now changes afoot in these. Okay, I, I just want to make a few points on that. So we mentioned uh, Republic is asking for the money to be returned. Now, in terms of money, uh, like it must be said that that uh, basically out of all the ministries, uh, only four of them had official ministry pages. Uh, so, so the vast majority of uh, Facebook spend. Uh, was being spent on um, individual politicians' uh, pages, and, and just yeah. to, to m explain what that means, let's take Minister Conrad Mitzi, you know, who was Minister of Tourism. So, so he um, he would have amassed tens of thousands of likes and follows by boosting content that is produced by the ministry on his Facebook page. Then, when he stops being Minister of Tourism, uh, he keeps those followers and and, and likes, etc. And the Ministry of Tourism has to start from scratch. Um, so that's quite problematic in terms of like how much money we know was spent. We know that 1.2 million was spent in, in the span of 55 months, which basically comes to almost 25,000 euros every month. At least, uh, at, so, least at least, at least, yeah, at least. That's just on boosting. That was just on boosting posts. Exactly. So when you think about boosting, it's usually a fraction of the amount of money spent on the content and, and other aspects, even running the pages. I mean, these pages were run by public officials as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the, the ministers themselves or, or, or the people in the constituency office. So it's it's really confusing. It's all, as in it's, it's a really complex situation. I think it is a good idea for the Auditor General to, to investigate this and get to the bottom of uh, whether there were any really bad uh, uh, situations of, of, of really um, clear misuse of, of public funds. Um, and yeah, I think on, on a positive note, though, uh, yesterday we saw the health ministry setting up a, a Facebook page. So now it's no longer, you know, just Chris Fern's um, Facebook page giving out uh, this kind of information. We now have a Facebook page called Sacha. So that is again an example of, of, of good practice uh, that we expect now to be seeing throughout the, the cabinet. Because as things stand today, uh, according to the Standards Commissioner, the government has agreed to rectify the situation, but as we've seen in the past couple of days, uh, so far very little has been done to rectify that situation, except now uh, the, the Health Ministry itself. Uh, just another another note um, on, on similar lines, there was also a, a question about whether cabinet members are using their private emails um, because uh, that's what they listed on the Parliament website. Uh, and now we've had two um, cabinet members, Clayton Bartolo and Stefan Zrinzo, who have moved to stop using their private emails. Um, this was a, a big controversy on the, in the time of Joseph Muscat, who insisted on using joseph at josephmuscat.com instead of his uh, official email. So that's the, the Republica uh, story. We wait to see if there are any developments. Interestingly, as well, Republica is asking the Prime Minister to call for the Auditor yeah. General uh, investigation, right? They're not asking for, yeah. they're not going to the Auditor General themselves. No, the reason I suspect is, is purely political, right? So they want um, the Prime Minister to take a stance either way, because if he um, asks for an investigation, then it's kind of forcing his own hand. And um, if he doesn't, then it's it's kind of showing that, you know, his, his own acquiescence in this. So this, I'm seeing this as a purely political move by Republica, because obviously they could have just asked, asked, asked the Auditor General themselves. But, but fair enough. I mean, um, we we don't yet know where the Prime Minister stands on this, and now we have a, a full report by the Standards Commission, and let's let's wait and see how he responds to it. So we'll move on to the next story over the weekend. We had a, a video uh, from one from a hair salon in San Juan that that basically showed us what. Uh, hairdressing in the future, in the very near future, could look like. So what we're talking about are masks on our faces, hand sanitizers uh, always available, perspex glass, um, perspex separating us from, from one another, and over shoes, over our shoes. Uh, so, so yeah, it's like, uh, I guess, 
there's a lot of eagerness uh, for for these hairdressers to to reopen um, and and hairdressers as we saw with with uh, nail salons as well um, are, are gearing up to be able to provide COVID friendly uh, services. What do you make of those, Tim? Do you think uh, that's, that's what it's going to look like? COVID unfriendly services, I suppose. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean. Let's just let's just take into account. Okay, this this was the initiative of one private hair salon. Um, it's not the official advice uh, as to how haircuts are going to look like. In fact, yesterday, interestingly, the prime minister said that you know, while there will be restrictions, we don't want to make it too painful or too extreme. He said that I don't want to get to a point where people are scared to look at each other or scared to con to engage with each other. So uh, perhaps the the measures won't be as as extreme i mean obviously um the, there will be changes um and um as it's as it stands um they will reopen hairdressers and, but all other businesses by the end of the month um i i imagine it's going to be um like something that's in in, in incredible demand at the moment um haircuts obviously i i also yeah. wonder uh, <laughs> i mean Maybe a funny question, but about barbers, like, I mean, how are you going to shave a beard if someone has a mask on? Yeah, that's that's a good point. And maybe we'll wait to see some barbers releasing some some videos as well. Um, so we're running out of time, but we'll just get into the the last story. Um, uh, the story from Friday night, actually. Uh, we obviously had an Oven Daily uh, since then. I think it's worth uh, talking about a 48 year old man uh, died after. Um, receiving an injection and stun gun uh, when the police were involved in, in an altercation at his house, right? Um, what, what can you tell us about the story, Tim? Um, so what we know so far is that the the police are called into his, this man's house um, because there was an incident that this guy was apparently throwing stuff off his roof. That's what we know. Um, so it seems like, like there were problems going on. And, um, you know, they calmed the situation down. They left, and then they had to be called in again because of the of problems with this man's doctor, and um, eventually the situation got out of hand. And we don't know exactly what led to what or or or, or how, but at one point, the doctor did inject the man. The police did fire a stun gun at him, and a few hours later, the man died um, in hospital. So, I mean, it's quite clear that there are elements to this story that have not been told by the police um the sequence of events but in particular um and i mean i i just obviously this is this is um this is a case that i hope doesn't just does not go away you know i mean it's very easy for some of these cases to just fall by the wayside without anyone ever finding out exactly what happened um again i'm not i'm not, I'm not blaming anyone here i mean it could there could be a it could be more mundane um, issues than than it, than it seems, but I, I mean we do need to know what happens. So I look for I look forward to the truth being established here. Yeah. Like there's an inquiry being held as well, and we'll wait to see the outcome of that inquiry. And um, so that's all we've got for you for today. And uh, this was Loving Daily, brought to you by Browns and You. Um, I've been Chris Perejin, joined by Esther Tim Diacono. Uh, hope you have a great start to the week. It's a Monday uh, and hope you have a day full of loving.